Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. It was nearly 8.30 in the evening on December 10th, 2003 in Sugarland, Texas. The sun had been down for hours. The wind, which reached a whopping 25 miles per hour that morning, had finally calmed down. And the world seemed almost peaceful, albeit a little chilly at 44 degrees. It was Wednesday, which was and is church night in places like Sugarland. Many people have some sort of Bible study they would just be getting home from, including Fort Bend County Detective Marshall Slot. Slot had barely walked through his own front door after attending church when he was paged. The sheriff's department needed him at a crime scene. There was a shooting in an upper-class suburban home. A family of four was attacked by an armed intruder with a gun. It looked like a burglary gone wrong. Detective Marshall Slot was shocked. This type of major, violent crime was rare in Sugarland. Even today... 20 years later, Sugarland's rate of violent crime is more than 75% lower than the national average. It's a well-worn trope to say, things like this just don't happen here. But in this case, it's true. As the on-call detective, Slot rushed into the suburban home. What he saw was devastating. The murder weapon had been stolen from a gun safe in the house, a locked gun safe that had been hidden in a bedroom crawl space. How had the intruder known where the gun was? From the jump, Slot suspected things were not as they seemed in the deaths of Kevin Whitaker and his mother, Tricia. And he was right. Things were, in fact, far worse. Welcome to episode 212, The Whitaker Family Slayings. Patricia Ann Bartlett was born in January of 1952 to parents Bill and Nettie Bartlett in Houston, Texas. From childhood, she always went by the nickname Trisha. Trisha and her younger brother were primarily raised in Texas, just like their parents had been before them. We don't know much about Trisha's childhood. However, we do know that her mother Nettie was a religious woman. At the time of 91-year-old Nettie's death in 2015, she was known for playing bridge at her local Methodist church. Perhaps Nettie's Christian beliefs were passed down to Trisha, because all her life, Trisha was a regular churchgoer herself. 18-year-old Trisha Bartlett graduated from Houston's Westchester High School in 1970. She then enrolled in the University of Houston to earn her bachelor's degree in education the friendly young woman joined the Delta Gamma sorority. Following college, Trisha taught children at various elementary schools. According to those who worked with Trisha, she was an excellent educator. She had a great rapport with children. Both parents and staff adored her. One fellow teacher remarked that Trisha was so good at her job, she felt like Trisha showed her how to be a better teacher and a better person. All her life, Trisha was energetic with a zest for the outdoors. She liked to water ski and snow ski, and she loved horseback riding. As I touched on before, Trisha was a very religious woman. Her friends and family described her as godly, sweet, and a compassionate Christian woman. Trisha regularly attended Sunday services, Bible studies, and women's fellowship groups at the River Point Community Church. The church is located in Richmond, Texas, which was only a six-minute drive from Trisha's home in Sugarland. Sugarland is a suburb 20 miles southwest of Houston, about a 30-minute drive. It is home to a bit over 100,000 people. It was under 70,000 when today's case took place. And by most metrics, Sugarland is a sweet place to live, pun intended. In 2022, the average median household income 
was 132000 That's nearly twice the average household income for the United States. The area is also known for its great schools and gorgeous vistas. Sugarland got its name because it used to be a major sugar producer. Starting back in 1843, the Imperial Sugar Company's headquarters, sugar refinery, and distribution center were there. But in 2001, the Imperial Sugar Company filed for bankruptcy. Two years later, in 2003, they closed their operations in Sugarland. Today, Imperial Sugar has been purchased by U.S. Sugar. In 2003, Trisha lived in a four-bedroom house with two and a half baths with a pretty brick facade and a lush front yard with her husband, Kent, and her two sons, Kevin and Bart. Norman Kent Whitaker was born in July of 1948 to parents Thomas and Velma in Harris, Texas. From childhood, he went by Kent instead of his first name, Norman. Kent's father, Thomas, and his mother, Velma, were high school sweethearts. They met in the 1930s. But like so many young American men, Thomas was drafted to serve in World War II. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy. Fortunately, he returned home from the war unharmed. And that's when he and Velma, who had been waiting for her sweetheart, began their family in Houston, Texas. Thomas was a prominent electrical engineer and later a college professor at the University of Houston. Velma was a newspaper editor and artist, successful role models for Kent and his three siblings. In the early 1970s, Kent Whitaker went on a blind date. That's how he met Trisha Bartlett. They had an instant connection, bonding over many things, especially their faith. Both were regular churchgoers all their lives. And on June 21st, 1975, 26-year-old Kent married 23-year-old Trisha in Harris, Texas. Kent became the comptroller and part owner of a construction company. The company was very successful, so successful that later, Kent and Trisha's youngest son, Kevin, began working for the family business. Kevin Michael Whitaker was born on March 19, 1984 in Houston, Texas. During Kevin's high school years, He attended the Fort Bend Baptist Academy. It's a private Christian school. While there, Kevin played baseball and ran track. But he wasn't just an athletic guy. He was also very well-liked by his peers. He was elected junior class president and was awarded the Servant's Heart Award. Outside of school, Kevin loved to hunt and fish. And he, like the rest of his family, was a regular churchgoer. People who knew Kevin recall that he was a passionate Christian. After graduating from high school in 2002, Kevin attended Houston Community College and Texas A&M University at different times. For a while, Kevin's goal was to graduate as a member of the Texas A&M University Corps of Cadets, a student military organization. Kevin's friends and family explained that he was a very mature young man who appreciated justice. His friends would say that Kevin was a faithful, loyal, and determined young man who never compromised anything. A career in the U.S. military seems like it would have fit Kevin's personality perfectly. But for the time being, Kevin was happy working in the family business. In 2003, the Whitaker family appeared picture perfect. Everything seemed to be going their way. 51-year-old Trisha had retired from teaching almost 15 years before normal retirement age. 55-year-old Kent's successful career meant that they didn't need two incomes. 19-year-old Kevin was a sophomore in college and working for his father, and Kevin's older brother, 23-year-old Bart, was attending Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. Their home was beautiful, Their family was beautiful. It looked like their entire lives were beautiful. No one could have expected the tragedy to come. On the morning of Wednesday, December 10th, Bart called his family to share some exciting news. He had just finished his final exams at Sam Houston State University, which meant he was about to graduate college. One of Trisha's friends recalled how meaningful this moment was for Trisha. 
she was proudly looking forward to her son's graduation. To celebrate, Bart asked if the whole family could go out for dinner that night. So the Whitakers drove about 15 minutes to a nice seafood restaurant called Papado. It was in the nearby city of Stafford, Texas. They had a great time at dinner. They joked around, told stories, and took pictures. Bart was served a special dessert that had congratulations written in chocolate syrup across the bottom of the plate. And his parents gave him a Rolex watch, which is an extravagant gift. New Rolexes were priced between three and $6,000 back then. It was a nice family celebration for a young man's accomplishment. Around eight o'clock that evening, Kent, Trisha, Bart, and Kevin made their way back home. They walked in the front door of their Sugarland house at about 8.20 p.m. That's when suddenly, a male intruder shot all four members of the Whitaker family as they walked in the house. Kevin had gone through the doorway first. He was shot in the chest. His mother was on his heels and was also shot in the chest. Then came Kent. A bullet hit him in the shoulder. The force of it pushed him flat on his back out onto the front porch. Bart, who was the last Whitaker to enter the home because he had forgotten his cell phone in the car, watched his family be slaughtered. He saw his brother Kevin gurgle on his own blood as he lay dying. He saw his mom and dad cut down when the hot metal ripped through their bodies. Trying to help, Bart rushed the shooter, but he couldn't identify him. The shooter was wearing a black ski mask and black clothing, though Bart could tell he was white. He tried to wrestle the gun away from the man. In the process, Bart was shot in the arm. Then suddenly, the intruder managed to get away. A getaway driver had been waiting. The two criminals fled into the night, leaving a whole family bleeding out in their own home. Kent later told reporters that, as he felt the blood drain out of him, he thought, Oh my God, he shot all four of us. A neighbor named Cliff Stanley heard gunshots at the Whitaker's place and quickly ran over. He surveyed the horrific scene and could tell right away that 19-year-old Kevin Whitaker was dead. The other Whitaker family members weren't in much better shape. Kent, who was still lying on the front porch, told Cliff that he was bleeding badly. When Cliff asked what happened, Trisha moaned, He shot us. Around this time, someone called 911. It's unclear who, though it was likely Cliff. He told Kent, don't worry, buddy. Help is on the way. But Bart also could have called 911. Later on, several newspapers would request the 911 call recording through the Texas Public Information Act. Texas Attorney General indicated that authorities did not have to release that information and it appears that they never did. Regardless, someone, probably Cliff, called 911. And within minutes, several patrol cars were on the scene. Moments later, other emergency vehicles arrived as well. 51-year-old Trisha Whitaker was put on a life flight helicopter, but she was declared dead shortly after she arrived at the Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston. After Trisha, Kent was also flown by helicopter to the hospital. 23-year-old Bart was taken to a local hospital and treated, but 19-year-old Kevin was pronounced dead at the scene. Both Kent and Bart would fully recover from their injuries, but they were left with the devastation that Trisha and Kevin were gone forever. Trisha and Kevin's funeral services were held at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, December 16th, 2003, at the Sugar Creek Baptist Church. Mother and son were buried side by side in the Memorial Oak Cemetery in Houston, Texas. Several other family members were buried in the same cemetery, including Trisha's own parents. Trisha's tombstone epitaph reads, Wife, mother, sister, daughter, a teacher, loved by all. Kevin's is engraved, with son, brother, friend, a man after Christ's heart. More than 1,000 people attended Trisha and Kevin's joint memorial, during which several people made a point to tell Bart 
how much his younger brother Kevin had looked up to him. Brittany Barnhill, who went to senior prom with Kevin, told Bart, you were his hero. Meanwhile, Fort Bend County was hard at work investigating the case. Initially, the authorities were pretty sure that this was a standard burglary gone wrong. By a stroke of bad luck, the Whitaker family had walked in on an armed intruder robbing their home. But the burglary theory soon felt hinky. The facts were just not adding up. Take the crime scene. At first glance, the main bedroom looked like it was ransacked, but upon closer inspection, the dresser and nightstand drawers had been opened neatly, the exact same distance. Usually, burglars are in a hurry. They're yanking out the dresser drawers, often leaving them dumped on the floor. And that wasn't the only thing. As it turned out, no valuable items were taken from the Whitaker home. The intruder had not even stacked items near a door. Sometimes that happens if a burglar is filtering through things while preparing to bolt. But this burglar hadn't done that. They hadn't even touched the Whitaker's laptops or jewelry, two items that are usually target number one for theft. Then there was the matter of the murder weapon. The intruder had used a 9mm Glock handgun to shoot the Whitakers, but he didn't bring the gun with him. Instead, this intruder had found a gun safe in a fairly concealed area of the Whitaker house. It was well hidden in a bedroom crawl space. The thief had used a tool to pry it open. So, this person knew to bring a tool strong enough to open a locked gun safe. But they didn't think to bring their own gun? And how did they find the gun safe? Had they been planning to look for it all along? Detective Marshall Slot told 48 Hours, this is looking more and more like this person knew the gun was here and obtained it for a specific reason. The next logical question is which of the Whitaker family members owned this gun? It was Kevin's. It had been a gift from his older brother, Bart. Naturally, Detectives were checking out Bart and Kent's stories of that night. Bart told the authorities how he and his family had gone out to dinner to celebrate his impending college graduation. It only took a couple of phone calls to find out Bart Whitaker had been lying to his family. He had not finished his final exams for Sam Houston State University on December 10th. In fact, Bart wasn't even enrolled in SHSU. He was on academic probation. He had not stepped foot into a college classroom since the previous spring. And according to his transcripts, he wasn't anywhere near graduating. Based on Bart's credit hours, he was still a freshman. Police always look closely at the family first in these situations, and Bart's huge lie about graduating made him a suspect. The Fort Bend County detectives knew about Bart's deception before the funeral services for Tricia and Kevin. And they had informed Bart's father, Kent, of their suspicions. Kent was determined to find Tricia and Kevin's killer. He cooperated fully with the authorities at all times. But he didn't take this allegation against Bart seriously. According to his interviews with CBS, he couldn't fathom that Bart would have hurt his own family. And when Kent confronted his son, Bart denied everything. Except about his upcoming graduation. He told his dad that the stress of school was too much for him, and that he lied because he needed a break from school. According to Fort Bend County Assistant DA Jeff Strange, Bart claimed he had shared the truth with his mother before she was killed. But Bart did deny any involvement in the vicious attack on his family. He himself had been shot, he insisted. Still, the investigating officers had a feeling Bart was somehow to blame, especially after his police interviews. During the questioning process, he was incredibly vague. He kept saying he had forgotten information. His answers were littered with, I guesses and I don't remembers. At the exact same time mourners were shaking Bart's hand and giving him teary-eyed hugs, during the funeral of his mother and brother, detectives considered Bart the lead suspect. There was every reason to think that Bart had somehow 
attempted to kill his entire family, especially after an old friend of Bart's came out of the woodwork with some shocking allegations. Detective Marshall Slot told 48 Hours, bells and whistles started going off. Why is this kid lying to us? What's he got to hide? Thomas Bartlett Whitaker was born on New Year's Eve, 1979, in Harris, Texas. His middle name was his mother's maiden name, and he went by the short nickname instead of his first name. In the 1990s, Bart attended Clements High School, and he did well there. He was a smart guy. His classmates remembered his quick sense of humor. A friend of the family said that he was fun, witty, and respectful. Most people thought that Bart was a good son. He was a good son to both of his parents, but was perhaps closer to his dad. Kent and Bart often bonded over their passion for biking. They would frequently take long bike rides together. Kent later stated in interviews that he and his son talked about everything. Of course, parents often have blind spots because Bart had his fair share of secrets. In high school, he had a friend named Adam Hip. On at least one occasion, Bart and Adam had stolen more than one computer. We don't have any details on this crime. They might not have even been caught at the time. We only know the minor details relating court documents. After graduating from high school, Bart studied at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. That's where he met two other young men, Will Anthony and Justin Peters. Like Bart, they also came from well-off families and they were high achievers. Will would go on to pursue a career in the military, and Justin had been a National Merit Scholar in high school. The three college boys were described as clean-cut and all-American. But Bart, Will, and Justin were anything but clean-cut. According to court testimony, in December of 2000, Bart told Will and Justin that he wanted to kill his own family. He said that he hated them. According to Assistant DA Jeff Strange, Bart wanted to inherit his family's share of the construction business, but he knew he couldn't murder his entire family on his own, so he asked Will and Justin to help. The plan was simple. Will was going to be the shooter. Bart would give him a black shirt and a ski mask to hide his identity. Then, per court documents, Bart would take his family out to dinner at a restaurant. Meanwhile, the masked Will would lay in wait in the Whitaker family home. As Bart's family was entering through the front door following the mill, Will would shoot them one by one. Then, Bart would inherit his family's estate, which was worth approximately $1.5 million. That's more than $2.5 million today. And he would pay Justin and Will for their troubles though the agreed-upon amount was not clear. Everything was set in place. But when Will was attempting to break into the Whitaker home through a back window, a loud security alarm went off. Will fled. Unfortunately, Justin's potential role wasn't published anywhere, but we can assume that he was supposed to be the getaway driver. So this plan didn't work, but it certainly sounds familiar. About a year later, Bart started discussing a similar murder plot with his high school buddy, Adam Hip. Bart wanted Adam to be the shooter this time. He even drew Adam a diagram of the Whitaker home. This time, Bart knew he needed to leave a door unlocked, and he wanted Adam to shoot him in the arm so he would appear to be a victim too. According to ADA Jeff Strange, Bart was going to get a gun for Adam from his old college roommate, Justin Peters. But in the spring of 2001, one of Adam's friends heard about this murder plot. This friend, Jennifer, who knew Bart too, approached him about this horrific plan. When she asked Bart if he was actually going to murder his family, he responded in the weirdest way. He gave her a hug and whispered in her ear that everything was going to be okay. Then, Jennifer did what all of these people should have done. She contacted the police. When the authorities came to Bart's parents about his plan to kill them with Adam Hip, 
They waved it off. Bart was trying to kill them? Are you sure? Our son Bart? I can practically hear how ludicrous that could sound to a parent. The idea that your flesh and blood could be plotting your death sounds insane. Bart's parents had showered him in vacations, cars, gifts, college tuition, and more. He had lived a lavish lifestyle compared to most. Not that all these material things should matter. Trisha and Kent loved Bart. This was not a secretly abusive household. Kent and Trisha Whitaker cared about their sons. Ultimately, the idea that Bart was going to kill his family was chalked up to a strange misunderstanding. Soon, Bart brainstormed yet another murder plot against his family. We know about it because he told Adam Hip. Adam later testified to it in court. Allegedly, Bart was going to set his family's lake house on fire. He intended for his parents, brother, and more relatives to die inside the burning building. Such a horrific way to die, and he was planning on hurting more people. Unlike his other schemes, where he thought an injury could save him from guilt, he planned on getting burned in the fire too. That way, when he escaped alive, no one would ask questions. But according to Adam's testimony, Bart never took any actions on this plan. In 2001, Bart moved about 150 miles from Waco to Huntsville, Texas. He was transferring from Baylor to Sam Houston State University. In Huntsville, Bart worked at the Bentwater Yacht and Country Club. While there, he developed a friendship with a co-worker, 21-year-old Chris Allen Brashear. Bart and Chris ended up renting a townhouse together near Willis, Texas, and they lived in the same complex as 21-year-old Stephen Wayne Champagne. They all became close. Bart even got Stephen a bartending job at the Bentwater Club. By now, you know Bart's song and dance. He wanted to murder his family, and he wanted both Chris and Stephen to help him do it. Chris was to be the shooter, Stephen was going to be the getaway driver. This time, Bart successfully orchestrated an attack on his family. Chris Brashear was in fact the shooter, and Stephen Champagne was the getaway driver. Finally, Bart Whitaker's horrible schemes came to fruition. On December 10, 2003, he was there when his entire family was ambushed, getting the minor injury as part of the plan. But Kent surviving was not part of the plan. On the night of the ambush, Chris ran from the Whitaker house and jumped in the car with Stephen. When Stephen asked him what happened, Chris said he had shot them all. Then, according to ADA Jeff Strange, Stephen and Chris went drinking, using the money stolen from the Whitaker house to pay their tab. Five days after the murders of Trisha and Kevin Whitaker, the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Department received a big break in their case. Bart's old pal Adam Hip was now a Dallas bank teller. After hearing about the Whitaker family tragedy, he called the Fort Bend authorities. Adam wanted to provide some important insight about Bart Whitaker. At 11.30 p.m. on Monday, December 15th, Adam met with Detective Marshall Slott in a parking lot behind the police department. According to court documents, Adam told the detective everything about Bart's 2001 plot to kill the Whitakers, about the diagram Bart had drawn him, about the potential lake house fire, about Bart's inexplicable hatred of his family, and, of course, Bart's incessant desire to inherit his family's estate of $1.5 million. Adam spoke to the detective for approximately three hours, and that's how the investigating officers were damn near certain they knew who their perpetrator was even before Trisha and Kevin Whitaker were buried. Following the authorities' conversation with Adam Hip, they thought he might have been involved in the plot to kill the Whitaker family too, but he wasn't. Adam had been working at the bank late into the evening of December 10th. 
With Adams' airtight alibi, he was no longer considered a suspect. After talking with Adam, the police found Bart's old roommate, Justin Peters. Justin admitted to everything, too. The information Justin provided led the authorities to Will Anthony. Meanwhile, Adam agreed to help the authorities. Under police instruction, he called Bart several times and recorded their conversations. Adam told Bart that he was reaching out because the police were traveling to Dallas to talk to him. Then Adam brought up the failed 2001 murder scheme and how it was oddly similar to what happened to his family. In response, Bart tried to pay Adam to lie to the police. They agreed on a price of $20,000. In April of 2004, Bart began mailing small increments of cash to Adam. He used an old address on the mailers and the pseudonym K. Soze. According to ADA Jeff Strange, one of Bart's favorite movies was The Usual Suspects, which, if you aren't familiar, features a criminal mastermind villain named Kaiser Soze. But Bart Whitaker was no Kaiser Soze. He had left his fingerprints all over the envelope containing the cash he had sent to Adam. Additionally, investigators learned that Bart had a roommate named Chris Brashear. Then they found out about Bart and Chris's neighbor and co-worker, Stephen Champagne. When Sugarland detectives interviewed Chris and Stephen, they had the two men submit scent samples. While Stephen's scent samples didn't match anything, bloodhounds alerted that Chris's scent sample was in numerous concerning locations. The murder weapon, drawers in the main bedroom, the gun safe, and a glove that had been recovered from the crime scene. Initially, Chris denied any involvement in the Whitaker murders. But when the detectives told Chris they could definitively link him to the crime scene, he appeared horrified and panicked. From the winter to the spring of 2003, Bart lived with his father, Kent, in the same Sugarland home where his mother and brother were killed. Kent continued living with his son because he did not believe Bart was involved in the murders, despite what authorities told him. Kent told the Houston Chronicle, the police were carrying on an investigation I felt was misplaced, and if they were right, what could be more horrifying? In late June of 2003, Bart could tell law enforcement was getting closer to charging him. When Justin Peters called him, Bart was spooked. So he ran. Bart told his father he was going out to a club one night. He said he would see Kent the next day. But Bart never came home. Instead, he stole $10,000 from Kent. And on June 28, 2004, Bart's Chevy Yukon was found abandoned in a parking lot in southwest Houston. For more than a year, authorities had no idea where Bart Whitaker was. It was like he had vanished into thin air, but they were still working the case. They spent a lot of time monitoring the phone calls of people Bart knew, like Chris Brashear and Stephen Champagne. Chris still lived in the Houston area, but Stephen had moved to the West Coast. 23-year-old Stephen had graduated from Marine Intelligence School. By the summer of 2005, he was stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. For months, investigators had been hounding him for more information. In late August of 2005, Stephen made a trip back to Texas. There, he met with Fort Bend Detective Marshall Slot at a Starbucks. After some hemming and hawing and pressure from the FBI, Stephen finally admitted to everything. Shortly after, he provided a video-recorded confession, during which Stephen implicated himself, Chris, and Bart in the murders of Trisha and Kevin Whitaker. After his confession, Stephen took the law enforcement officers to a bridge that crossed Lake Conroe. Stephen explained how he and Chris had dropped a canvas bag of evidence there. The police soon recovered it. Inside was a vacuum cleaner, a license plate, money, a water bottle with Chris's DNA on it, the chisel Chris had used to break into the gun safe, the ammunition from the murder weapon, and two cell phones that Bart had given to Chris and Stephen to use while carrying out the plot to kill his family. Following the discovery of this evidence, arrest warrants went out for Stephen Champagne 
Chris Brashear, and Bart Whitaker. Stephen and Chris were arrested by mid-September. They were transported to Texas jailhouses. But Bart was still at large. Until a man claiming his name was Mike Jones called Detective Marshall Slot. He said, I know where Bart Whitaker is. I helped him get there. All Mike wanted in return was the $10,000 reward money. As it turns out, Mike Jones was actually Rogelio Rios. He went by Rudy. Rudy met Bart when they both worked at a hotel restaurant in Houston. Rudy was a busboy and Bart was a waiter. One day, Bart was complaining to Rudy about how the police were on his back. So Rudy offered to help. He explained that he had family in Mexico. They could get Bart out of the United States for a fee. Bart paid Rudy $3,000 out of that $10,000 he had stolen from his father and began a new life in the small town of Soralvo, Mexico. Soralvo has a population of about 8,000 and is about 400 miles southwest of Sugarland, Texas. Now, Bart went by the name Rudy Rios, and he told people that he was AWOL from the United States military. He claimed that he had served in Afghanistan until his team was ambushed in a horrific firefight, during which Bart claimed he was shot in the arm. That's why he had fled, and why he didn't want to return to the U.S. Bart lived in Mexico for 15 months. There is no indication that he intended to return to the States. Instead, he learned some Spanish. He rented out an apartment from the real Rudy Rios' father, and he began dating a young woman named Cindy Lou Salinas. And Cindy helped Bart get a job at her family's furniture store. Actually, Bart became really close to Cindy's siblings, parents, and other relatives. He told the Salinases that they were the family he never had. Bart told Cindy that he was an only child, and he also told her that his mother was a sex worker. He claimed that he never loved his mother because she never loved him. After the real Rudy Rios contacted the Fort Bend authorities, Mexican officials captured Bart Whitaker. He had fled from Soralvo to Monterey, Mexico to avoid capture, but law enforcement nabbed Bart when he went to a job interview at a local restaurant. On Thursday, September 22, 2005, 25-year-old Bart Whitaker was arrested in Laredo, Texas. When Kent first laid eyes on his son after his arrest, Kent said, well, you look like you're okay. To which Bart replied, yes. And then Bart began apologizing profusely for the entire ordeal. By December of 2005, the Fort Bend District Attorney's Office announced that they would seek the death penalty against Bart Whitaker. Fred Felkman, the assistant DA who prosecuted Bart's case, felt that he easily met the criteria for it. According to Felkman, Bart had showed he was a continuing threat. Plus, there were zero mitigating factors in Bart's life that could explain his behavior. After all, Bart had not been abused or neglected or suffered from any known mental illnesses. In fact, he had experienced a childhood many Americans dream of. Felkman told CBS, I find it hard to believe anybody wouldn't think he deserved it. One year later, in December of 2006, Bart sent ADA Fred Felkman a Christmas card. He wrote to Fred, keep your family in mind during the holiday season. This was interpreted by many as a veiled threat against Fred's family. Since the double homicide had occurred, Bart's father, Kent, had spoken publicly about how he had forgiven his son, Chris, and Stephen for murdering Trisha and Kevin. Kent attributed his forgiveness to his Christian faith. He told the Houston Chronicle, It wasn't human. This was a gift I believe God gave me. Kent also said to the Chronicle, I realized that maybe God had allowed me to live so I could display that unconditional love. Kent's Christianity was also a main factor as to why he advocated against Bart receiving the death penalty. While Kent agreed that Bart should remain in prison for his crimes, he did not understand why Bart had to be put to death. 
While the state sought the death penalty against Bart, they agreed not to seek the death penalty for the shooter, Chris Brashear. And the getaway driver, Stephen Champagne, had accepted a plea deal. In exchange for his testimony during Bart's trial, he would be sentenced to only 15 years in prison. Bart's trial began in March of 2007. He was held in Fort Bend County. He was represented by defense attorney Randy McDonald. As far as trials go, this one was pretty much open and shut. It only took six days, and there's no question as to why. The prosecution had Bart's father, Kent, as an eyewitness to the murders. They had bagged the evidence from Conroe Lake. They had Bart's recorded phone calls with Adam Hip. They had Adam Hip himself there to testify. And they also called to the stand Justin Peters and Will Anthony. And of course, the state had Stephen Champagne's testimony as per his plea deal. During the trial, Stephen devastatingly revealed that Bart was continuing to plan his father Kent's murder, even after the deaths of Trisha and Kevin. When Stephen and Bart were eating dinner together in February of 2004, Bart said the job wasn't finished. Then he outlined plans for Kent's death. Meanwhile, Bart's defense team all but conceded that Bart had orchestrated the massacre of his own family. They called zero witnesses to the stand. The evidence against Bart was so insurmountable that their only goal was to try to get him life in prison rather than death. On March 5th, 2007, after two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury convicted 27-year-old Bart Whitaker of capital murder for his mother and younger brother. During the sentencing process, which in Texas is known as the punishment phase, Bart himself testified. He said, as per court documents, I am 100% guilty for this. I put the plan in motion. If I had not done so, it would not have happened. Bart agreed that he had robbed his mother and his younger brother of their lives. He even agreed that he had robbed his surviving father, Kent, of his life in some ways. Bart claimed that he felt remorse. When asked why he did what he did, Bart said, I have come up with a lot of reasons for how I got to where I was going, but they do not explain it. I always felt that whatever love they sent me was conditional on a standard that I just never felt I could reach. Which sounds like he is still blaming his family for their own murders. Selfish to the rotten end. In an attempt to dissuade the jury from giving him the death penalty, Bart told them that he was not going to be an ongoing threat. He explained that, quote, the only people I've ever hated, and I know it was not for the right reasons, but the only people I ever hated were my parents and my brother. Randy McDonald, Bart's defense attorney, responded, but the irony of it all is that your dad is actually the one that's come to your rescue and put you back on track. To which Bart said, He's become my best friend in the last year. But Assistant District Attorney Fred Felkman didn't buy what Bart was selling. He later referred to it as crap. During the court proceedings, Felkman asserted that Bart was just playing the remorseful son because he was trying to get out of the death penalty. If Bart hadn't been caught, he wouldn't be saying any of this. Felkman thought Bart was just making the best of a bad situation by manipulating the jury. Felkman may have been convincing, but it was still a difficult decision. The jury took 12 hours of deliberation over the course of two days before they returned the verdict on Thursday, March 8, 2007, that Bart Whitaker was sentenced to death by lethal injection. For the record, I appreciate any jury that deliberates that long over the death penalty. It may be the law of their state, and they had to be death penalty certified, but they clearly took that momentous decision seriously. A juror told the Houston Chronicle, we were almost split evenly on whether or not he was a continuing threat. Most jurors were swayed because Bart had lived a life of extreme comfort. How could someone who had so much want to murder the people who had given it to him? Ultimately, 
the final juror, who was holding out that Bart was not a continuing threat, folded. They realized that Bart was driven by lies and deceit. This holdout juror said of their changed mind, I think that the core person always surfaces. After Bart's trial, in September of 2007, Chris Brashear, the getaway driver, accepted a plea deal. Rather than be charged with capital murder, he accepted the lesser charge of murder, which other states refer to as second-degree murder. As the actual shooter, Chris was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years. Following his trial and sentencing, Bart appealed several times. None of these appeals were successful. The U.S. Supreme Court denied his appeal without explanation in October of 2017. After Bart exhausted his final options, his execution was scheduled for Thursday, February 22nd, 2018, at 6 p.m. in Huntsville, Texas. For years, Bart's father, Kent, had continuously spoken to news outlets about commuting Bart's sentence. Kent firmly believed that his son should receive life in prison, not death. Kent said to reporters, we're not asking him to forgive him or let him go. We just want them to let him live. And incredibly, Kent Whitaker's campaign for his son's life worked. A week before Bart's execution, Kent spoke with the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles. Two days before the execution was scheduled, the seven-member board unanimously recommended clemency for Bart. The board's decision Tuesday was seven to zero, and no one seemed more shocked than Kent Whitaker. This is Texas, he said. This doesn't happen, and I am just so encouraged that the system has worked. This was the right thing, the right thing to do. But clemency could actually only be granted by the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott. When that fateful Thursday arrived, Kent visited his son one final time to say goodbye. Bart ate his last meal. It seemed that despite all of Kent's work and the board's decision, Bart's death was near. But 40 minutes before Bart was to be injected with lethal drugs, Governor Abbott commuted his sentence. Instead of being executed, Bart would remain in prison for the rest of his life without the possibility of parole. In response to his commutation, Bart said, I'm thankful, not for me, but for my dad. Any punishment that I would have or will receive is just, but my dad did nothing wrong. The system worked for him today, and I will do my best to uphold my role in the system. Bart's commutation was huge news. It was an extremely rare occurrence as Texas executes five times as many people as the next closest death penalty state, which is Oklahoma. And in nine years of being governor, Abbott has only commuted one other sentence. It was the first time in more than a decade and only the third time since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. In explaining his decision, Governor Abbott cited the fact that Whitaker's co-conspirator, the Trigger Man, did not get the death penalty, and that Kent Whitaker, the surviving victim, quote, passionately opposed the execution and would be victimized again by the death of his last remaining immediate family member. He also pointed out that Bart Whitaker had waived any possibility of parole and would spend the rest of his life in prison. Along with the board's decision, Abbott said it was the totality of these reasons which determined his decision. The prosecutor, Fred Felkman, thought that this decision was inappropriately based on Kent's forgiveness of his son. He felt the governor and the board were not considering the other people affected by these murders. Felkman also said they had ignored psychiatrists and investigators' testimony that indicated Bart Whitaker was manipulative. In later interviews, Felkman suggested that Bart was a sociopath. Today, the getaway driver, 42-year-old Stephen Champagne, served his 15 years and is no longer in prison. And if his parole is granted, trigger man Chris Brashear will be 55 years old when he leaves prison in 2037. Right now, he is 41 years old and is incarcerated in the J. Dell Wainwright unit. 
Bart Whitaker is now 44 years old. He is incarcerated in the William J. McConnell unit in Beeville, Texas. While in prison, Bart reconnected with his Christianity. And to date, he has earned two bachelor's degree in English and sociology from Adams State University. His master's degree is in humanities from California State University. Bart's writing has been published in Guernica, the Washington Post Magazine, The Marshall Project, and more. And he started a fairly well-known online journal entitled Minutes Before Six. Originally, it was just Bart writing to his father, who would then publish his work on the blog. Now, incarcerated people from across the map publish writing and art on the blog. Bart also wrote a book about his views on the prison system, but it's out of print now, probably due to the fact that in 2019, he faced a lawsuit about his book. He was accused of trying to make money selling the book on Amazon. In Texas, offenders cannot profit from their convictions. I read a summary of his book. Basically, Bart doesn't like prison. The end. Bart's father, Kent, retired from the construction industry and remarried in 2009. He and his wife are motivational speakers. They discuss topics like Christianity, grief, and forgiveness all over the country. Kent has also written a book. It's entitled Murder by Family, The Incredible True Story of a Son's Treachery and a Father's Forgiveness. I feel tremendously happy that Mr. Whitaker found peace in forgiving his son and has moved on with his life, happily remarried. It is rare that I can report on a surviving family member's happiness in this way, especially one that was wounded with their lost loved ones. Forgiveness is sacrosanct to many Christians, and I respect that. But I personally agree with Fred Felkman about Bart Whitaker's character. This was no abused, suffering teen who made a rash decision. This was a manipulative grown man who coldly plotted to murder his loving family for years. Multiple times, he tried to enlist conspirators as he dreamed only of inheriting his family fortune. He repeatedly told these people he hated his parents and brother. Blind, unreasonable hate. I believe the commutation gives Bart an unearned air of redemption. It would have been more reasonable for the DA to take the death penalty off the table to begin with since Kent Whitaker was so opposed to it. The jury voted for death, so I'm sure they would have given him a life sentence without parole. He has that now. And he is also now the forgiven son, unfairly bathed in a kind of absolution. I don't like it. I don't believe he deserves this image. As much joy as I feel for Kent in his new life, my heart still aches for Trisha and Kevin. Kevin had his whole life ahead of him. He was cut down so young, before he could even decide what he wanted to be in life, before he fell in love, before he had his own family. And Trisha had only just retired. She was probably immersed in things like gardening, church groups, spending time with friends, and just enjoying her well-earned rest. And probably looking forward to grandchildren. Grandchildren that will never be. Two beautiful lives stolen so unfairly for such a heartless, selfish reason by someone they loved so dearly. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by me and Andrea Marshbank. As usual, any editorial comments and opinions are my own. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brendan Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. Today's case was suggested by Jessica, Donna, Michelle, and Kyle. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, and click on the listener suggestion tab, or email sftcresearch at gmail.com. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. 
please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages, but please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit asses allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review. I'm on all large platforms like iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, and YouTube. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.